quickly before I start the story, I just wanted to say thank you all for a hundred subs. That was really cool. Um, anyway, quote love unquote by New Amsterdam. Chapter 25. Bakugo feels a headache coming on as soon as Deku enters the room, but it's not as if that's anything new. With his star rising over the past few years, he's done any number of these talk show interviews. When he was 17, he was sandwiched on a couch between Deku and Todoroki, grinding his teeth together as they answered questions about the storyline he had championed, while the audience screamed for him to hold Uraraka's hand. Before that, long, long before that, he was five or six, sitting next to a Yagi Toshinori, who had whittled away to skin and bones in a matter of months, as they still promoted the story that was probably responsible for putting Yagi-san's life in jeopardy. And then, over the past few months, he's been running the circuit with Shindo Yu, ignoring his knife-sharp smiles and doing his best to act like a goddamn professional. Today should be no different. A makeup artist has attacked his face with concealer and eyeliner, a hairstylist has fluffed his hair for the seventeenth time, and even Sarah would come by to straighten the collar of his shirt and offer him two thumbs up and a wide grin. Now he's sitting backstage, ready for his cue, and Deku has to come and sit beside him. It really is shaping up to be a fan-fucking-tastic day, isn't it? Deku's shirt reads flannel on it, and his jeans are cuffed to show off his trademark red sneakers. How Deku turned being a starless nerd into a personal brand, Bakugo has never quite figured out. He still doesn't get what draws everyone towards Deku, what's made him so successful. It's so, so irritating. It's kind of weird being back on the show together, isn't it? Deku says, rubbing a hand through his messy hair. Whoever his hairstylist is, they're either having a competition or have just given up entirely at this point. Bakugo barely looks at him. It was planned this way, moron. The four of us back on the same show we did the first promos for fucking UA on. Deku presses his lips together, gives Bakugo a too patient look. I know that. I just meant, now that it's actually happening, doesn't it feel strange? Like we've gone back in time or something. Bakugo turns his head to look Deku straight in the eye and blinks at him owlishly. As loath as he has to admit it, I aren't fifteen anymore. Deku's grown up to be solidly built, his t-shirt sleeves tight over his muscles. His green eyes are still big, round, and watery, but there's a confidence in him that Bakugo never would have guessed at in a million years, either ten years ago or five. They haven't gone back in time at all. There's no denying how much has changed, how much things have moved forward since then. Is it clear when people look at him, too? Yagi-san had mentioned how much he'd grown, had invited Bakugo over for dinner one night so that they could watch Ground Zero together, and Yagi-san could offer Bakugo all his praises. He had smiled, but held his tongue when Bakugo's character on screen pulled off a stunt that was a direct homage to the first All Might movie. Has he moved forward at all? Gritting his teeth, he resists the urge to reach into the pocket of his jeans for his cell phone. It's been weeks. If Kirishima wanted to call him, he would have by now. Bakugo's favor from Yagi-san had been a last-ditch attempt to offer some kind of olive branch without totally embarrassing himself. And so far, there's been no response. Maybe he was wrong all along, and now all he's left with is this painful emptiness and the shame of having been wrong. Not everyone's a nostalgia crybaby like you, Bakugo mutters, sinking further back into the couch cushions, crossing his arms to keep from reaching for his phone. No, I guess not, Deku agrees. Anyway, I like how things are now better. A flash of envy strikes Bakugo like a slap in the face. He wishes he could be sure that his life now was better than it was before that everything he's fought for and experienced has been worth it. But with this huge, gaping hole in his life, in his heart, he can't pass out the rest of his feelings at all.
Hosted by Takayama Yu, Mountain View is the most watched talk show in the country. An actress herself, somehow Takayama has made a brand out of her sharp tongue, bargain hunting lifestyle, and general love of life. So, kiddos, she says, legs thrown over the arm of her plush back armchair. Here you are, back again. Across from her at an angle sit Bakugo, Deku, Todoroki, and Uraka. They're dressed casually, but with style, primped and pressed for this appearance. It's Todoroki who speaks first, blinking at Takayama before saying flatly, You did invite us. Takayama throws her head back and laughs, blonde curls bobbing with the motion. She swings her legs around so that her bright purple heels hit the floor, then leans forward conspiratorially. Okay, okay. Let's get down to it then. The cast of UA reunited and working with Yagi Toshinori-san. What can you tell me about because he is my hero? This time Bakugo's the one who cuts in. It's a book. A book that's been out for about 50 years. If you're so damn curious, just read it. Deku leads forward on the couch, waving his hands in front of his face. A lot of people have read the book and loved it, and that's why I was so excited to finally bring it to the big stage. Yagi-san met the author before he passed away, when he was our age, and now he wants to adapt the novel to tell the story in a way it couldn't be told, back when it was published. Takayama arches one perfectly groomed eyebrow. Oh, and what does that mean exactly? Todoroki shrugs. The prince's right hand in that book is a very loyal knight. Instead of casting the role with a male actor, Yayo's Rumomo is going to play the part. I like the sound of Yamomo with a sword and armor, Takayama says approvingly. The audience is quick to agree with her. So will Jiro, Bakugo thinks. That sends a pang through him, because he hasn't seen any of the members of Riot since Todoroki's birthday party. And it's not that he cares, really, but he'd gotten used to having them around. Somehow, they'd become his friends. Anyway, Uraka is saying, we can't give everything away. We don't even know everything yet. But we're really excited to start filming the movie, and eventually, for all of you to see it. It's so great seeing you all together again, Takayama says. Not that you haven't been doing great on your own, you little prodigies. Award season is coming up. Anything you're particularly excited for? Uraka's cheeks turn pink. I don't like speculating about things like that. I'm rooting for Uraka-chan in Zero Gravity, Deku says enthusiastically. Aside from the fact that Uraka is one of my best friends, I think it's the best show that's been on this year. You guys have all seen it, right? The audience cheers, and Uraka's cheeks go from baby pink to magenta. Bakugo huffs, his lips twitching upwards. Uraka's bashfulness isn't an act, but when she's on, her acting is the real deal. And on a prestige drama like Zero Gravity, no one else stands a chance against her. And someone else has been getting awards buzz, Takayama says, eyeing Bakugo. Bakugo rolls his eyes, all arrogance. Aizawa Shota is one of the most awarded directors in the game, even though his persona tends to fly under the radar, and people remember the names of his movies and the studio that produces him more than they remember shaggy, scraggly Aizawa showing up to awards shows in cotton t-shirts and loose pants. Make My Story needed a director of his caliber to be taken seriously, and to be viewed as a capital F film and not some niche genre fare. They managed to succeed in that. Critics have been lauding the direction, the screenplay, the acting. By all accounts, Make My Story is a success. Bakugo's been recognized for his TV acting countless times, but UA was a high school drama, and viewed as such by the industry. Make My Story is his first truly artistic film, with everything hinging on his acting ability. Now, he huffs. Who needs an award to tell them what they already know? The audience burst into applause, littered through whistles and cheers. Of course, if they're UA fans, or Bakugo fans in particular, this is exactly the kind of response they'd been hoping for. 
Come on, tell me you wouldn't want to be nominated for a quirky. Takayama insists. Like that isn't what every actor in the world is aiming for. Officially called the Shimura Nana Awards and widely acknowledged as the highest honor in the film industry, Quirkies gained their nickname via some anecdote Bakugo has never bothered to remember. It's the last award show of the season, and the biggest honor an actor, director, or anyone else in the industry can win is walking away with one of those little gold statues. Does he want one? Fuck yeah. Does he want to admit that on live TV? Hell no. All the average losers, he scoffs. Who cares about being nominated? If my performance was good, it should be an out-and-out -out victory. An undisputed first place. He stands by his work, by his talent, by his effort. And if his efforts in Make My Story were fueled by the fact he was falling in love in real time, then so be it. He deserves something from all this, doesn't he? He never told Kirishima that, did he? He never admitted how much he needed him to tell that story in a convincing, genuine way. He shakes his head, dislodging the unwelcome thoughts as Takayama moves on to ask Todoroki and Deku about what they've been doing this past year, what their award predictions are, who they may or may not be dating. Bakugo rolls his eyes when Deku starts blushing, and the idiot very unsubtly steals a glance at Todoroki. Fucking moron. If you don't want people speculating about you, don't be so goddamn obvious. Maybe everyone in the world really is an idiot, because Takayama doesn't call Deku out on his transparent-as-fuck crush on his co-star. Instead, she rounds on Uraka. So, we haven't seen you on the dating scene in a while, she says, curling her blonde hair around one finger. At least, not since the news was all over you and Bakugo. The tabloids really take everything as far as it will go, Uraka laughs pressing her hands against her cheeks. She pauses to glance at Bakugo, who rolls his eyes. As far as he's concerned, his days of being anyone's press boyfriend are over. Or needing a press boyfriend. Mixing all this shit up with what other people think of him is impossible, especially when he can't fix the one relationship he actually wants. But some things they get right, eh, Bakugo? Takayama says. What's the story with you and Kirishima these days? Was that a breakup or just a fight? Bakugo feels his face coloring, knows he's gone some hideous shade of red. This was not on the list of topics for this interview. If it had been, he would not, under any circumstances, have shown up. Why don't you go and f- I'm sure you've heard Takeyama-san about how busy Kirishima-kun is these days. Deku cuts in. Words all in a rush. Didn't you hear about the charity benefit concert that Riot's organizing? The what now? What the hell is Deku talking about? Oh yeah! Uraka says excitedly, sitting forward and clapping her hands. Minachan was telling me about it. There's so many great artists lined up to be a part of it, including Nejire chan She was my biggest idol growing up. Is this a conspiracy? How did everyone know about this but him? It's to benefit art programming for at-risk youth. Bakugo puts in his statted way, especially LGBT youth. Takayama's lips press together in a thin line, and she sighs mournfully. Yeah, the music industry is really light years ahead of us, aren't they? Still, I'm glad someone is stepping up. The other three are all quick to agree with her, gushing about Riot like they're paid advertisers. Jealousy stabs at Bakugo like a knife in the chest. Would any of them even know about Riot? About Kirishima if it wasn't for him? Wasn't he the one who introduced them all? How are they all so in the know, so friendly with them, when Bakugo's been locked out entirely? Uraka taps Bakugo's knee, and when he glances over at her, she gives him a pointed look trying to nudge him back into the conversation. So, you'll all be there, I bet, Takayama says. Will he? Bakugo wonders. Is he even fucking invited? A 
A few days later, Bakugo is woken by Furious knocking at his door. He feels like death, and it's not because he didn't fall asleep until 4am, because he was staring at his phone and willing Kirishima to call him. That isn't what happened at all, and if anyone says otherwise, he's gonna straight out murder them. Bakugo drags himself out of bed into his front door, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. It has to be someone he's allowed access to his building, so his guard is lowered when he pulls open the door and is immediately assaulted by a frankly excessive amount of pink. Were you asleep? A high-pitched voice calls out, as the blur of pink pushes past him and into the apartment. Wow, nice place! How come you've never invited us over? And why isn't the TV on? What are you doing, Bakugo? It's Ashida. Ashida Mina, Kirishima's goddamn best friend, is standing in his apartment like she has some kind of right to be there. She's holding a bag with one of Sato's restaurant names printed across it, and if the smell is anything to go by, she brought pancakes. Bakugo shakes his head and turns back towards the door. And it's only then that he realizes that Sarah would come in behind Ashido. He offers Bakugo a wave as he throws out of his shoes, and then kneels to retrieve two of the bottles of chilled champagne he'd placed against the wall. What the fuck is happening? Bakugo groans. He's wearing sweatpants and a tank top that Kirishima definitely left here. His face is creased from being squished against his pillows, and there's a headache pounding at the base of his skull with all the force of Kaminari's drumming. Did you forget? Sarah asks, helping Ashido out of her coat and hanging both their jackets by the door. Forget what? Bakugo grinds out. It's nominations day! Ashido throws her arms in the air, take out bags swaying dangerously until Sarah takes it from her. We're here to watch the show with you and offer moral support. Bakugo splutters like he's just been dunked in cold water. The nominations for the Shimura Nana Awards are being announced this morning, and he'd been so caught up in everything else that he'd completely forgotten. That still doesn't explain Ashido's presence in his foyer, though. He rounds on Sarah and crosses his arms over his chest, waiting for an explanation. I, um, we, Sarah says hooking a finger in a shirt collar and tugging nervously. Well, Ashida was over last night, and then this morning she said she wanted to come along. <laughs> what the fuck? How are Mrs. and Mr. Dysfunctional spending the night together when he and Kirishima are still apart? Where's the justice in that? Ashido huffs, tapping her foot impatiently. You don't have to look that surprised, Bakugo. Anyway, we're all friends, and I want to see the nominations, and eat pancakes, and drink champagne to celebrate when they say you're up for an award. She says that with such confidence, it's almost gratifying. Maybe people have friends so that there are others around to believe in them as much as they believe in themselves. Or more. Sarah glances at his watch. We've got 20 minutes. Bakugo, you want to go shower or something? We'll set up breakfast in the show. He ends up sandwiched between Sarah and Ashido on his couch, TV on and coffee table piled high with plates and drinks and utensils. The pancakes are delicious, and that eases Bakugo's mood enough that he doesn't kick the other two out when they keep stealing glances at each other over his head. He doesn't think that anyone other than the people in the industry actually watch the nominations. They just wait for the list to hit Twitter a few minutes after the show wraps. It is, in all honesty, Boring as fuck. The hosts are dressed to the nines, and they come out in a fanfare to announce each category and all the nominations. To anyone who doesn't know or care much about film, it's probably agonizing. But Bakugo's seen almost all of the movies, and he knows people in all of these sub-industries. The set and costume designers, the special effects crew, the screenwriters and directors, and, of course, the actors. He's been obsessed with his industry ever since he was a child, and now he finds himself explaining its ins and outs to Ashido, who asks questions in between categories. I haven't seen any of these movies, 
Ashido whines, wrinkling her nose. We were on tour for most of the year, and it's hard to get to a movie theatre when you're playing a show every third night. Bakugo bites down on the inside of his cheek, because all he can imagine is seeing all the nominated movies with Kirishima, and going on and on about what he thinks of each of them, and Kirishima looking at him and listening all the while, that stupidly handsome smile on his face. His mind either focuses on that, or the fact that acting nominations are coming up. In between, there's no peace for Bakugo. Make My Story lands its first nomination for Best Screenplay, putting fukukado san up for the award. The film is skipped over for Best Supporting Actor, which is where Shindo's performance would have landed him, given his role. Bakugo doesn't know how to feel about that. The movie couldn't have been made without Shindo, but the guy is still an asshole. But is he an asshole who deserved an acting nomination? He stops breathing sometime during the Best Actress nominations, knowing what's coming next. And for Best Actor, one of the hosts says, pulling open the golden envelope. To God Emilio for his role in The Million Man. Shishikura Seiji for Meat Cleaver. Nishiya Shinji for Out of the Woods. Kamihara Shinya for The Edge of the World. And Bakugo Katsuki for Make My Story. It's just a nomination, he thinks fast. Unless he wins the award, what good is it? But then Ashido and Saro are embracing him for either side. And they're both cheering. And Saro is trying to reach for the champagne without letting go of Bakugo. And Bakugo is grabbing her phone and saying, Pictures! I need a picture of the face you're making! And for a moment, Bakugo doesn't feel any doubts at all. Just a happiness that warms him up like sunshine. Because instead of being overshadowed by his rational mind, his joy is amplified by the feelings of those around him. Quirky nominated actor Bakugo Kotsky! Ashido cheers. And then Sarah joins in. And it becomes a chant. Quirky nominated actor Bakugo Kotsky! Quirky nominated actor Bakugo Kotsky! On the coffee table, Bakugo's phone lights up. A dozen text messages coming in all at once. Deku, Todoroki, Uraraka, Yayozuru, Ida, Aoyama, Sato, Higakure. Fucking hell. When did he give so many people his number? And how does he undo that terrible decision immediately? The rest of the nominations go by in a blur. Make My Story doesn't get a nod for Best Picture, but Aizawa is up for Best Director. For a film of its budget and riskiness, those are some considerable wins. Bakugo feels like he's just swallowed a cloud, something light and airy rising in his chest. You're happy, he thinks dumbly. This is something you can be proud of, without anyone casting a shadow over it. We've got rehearsal soon. Ashido says, by way of excuse, as the three of them take the empty plates to the kitchen. She casts a side-along look to Bakugo, then tugs him by the wrist out into the hall, away from Sarah. What? Bakugo grouses. Maybe, maybe he's alright with her showing up here, but he never once consented to being manhandled. Ashido tugs him in, speaks close to his ear. Chiro and Kaminari are still on guard duty, even though Kirishima really wanted to sneak out and be here today. I think... I think he knows his own feelings, and I trust him, but... You really, really hurt him, you asshole. She doesn't say this like any sort of accusation. Rather, it's just a naked fact. That makes it hurt more, somehow. Bakugo pulls himself away, crosses his arms over his chest. Well, he fucking hurt me too. You ever think of that? Ashiro sighs, hands on her hip. Of course I did. I'm not here to beat you up for him or anything. Bakugo scoffs at that. Who does Pinky think she's kidding? 
She'd never land a punch on him. Or getting someone else to do it either, she amends, her lips carving into a pout. You're both my friends, and I know what it's like to screw up a relationship because you're scared or selfish, okay? Her dark eyes dart back to the kitchen. Neither of them is under any illusions that Soro isn't hearing all of this. Just... Ashido takes a deep breath. You both really helped me out, you know? Kirishima is my best friend, and you're important to me too. So, don't tell the others, but here. She holds out a piece of reddish paper, folded neatly in half. Mutely, Bakugo takes it from her. She rushes back to the kitchen to say her goodbyes to Sarah, leaving Bakugo alone to unfold the paper and see what's written on it. The block letters are painfully familiar. You can almost see Kirishima's strong hand gripping the pen, forming the words. I knew you could do it. Wish I'd been there with you. He knew. He must have given the note to Ashido a day ago, long before she'd arrived here. He'd known. I believed that strongly in Bakugo's success. There hadn't been a doubt in Kirishima's mind. Tears prickle in Bakugo's eyes, and he roughly wipes them away with the back of his hand. Fuck. There really is just one thing. One person who can make his happiness complete. It's not like he hasn't tried to fix things. He told Yagi-san to call Crimson Chevalier, hadn't he? Who else would have been able to pull that off? But that plan hadn't given him cover, deniability. He hadn't had to lay himself bare, to accept either Kirishima's acceptance or his rejection. He hasn't taken that final, irrevocable risk. His hand clenches around the paper, and that's when he notices the second item tucked behind the card. It's a ticket, printed on sleek black cardstock, with words written across it in metallic red, pink, purple, and yellow. Riot and Midnight Records present the first annual Color Your World concert, featuring present Mike, Nejere Chan, Fat Gum, Sun Eater, and surprise guest appearances. Admit one, VIP guest. Well, shit. If he was waiting for an invitation, it looks like he just got one. I thought this was supposed to be exclusive, Bakugo grumbles, pushing his way past Todoroki, Uraka, and Yayozuru as he tries to get to his seat. Yayozuru will allow, because she's dating Jiro, but why the rest of them? Why do they rank as VIPs? The VIP box sits on a balcony, overlooking the stage, and above the massive area for standing room in front of it. The stadium is filled with seats. By the time it's full, it will hold tens and thousands of people. Kirishima is going to perform to this crowd? Does he know what he's getting himself into? They're the best seats in the house, Sarah says, taking a seat next to Bakugo. On his other side sits Agakure, who looks like she's been waving at Bakugo for five minutes before he actually notices her. Oh, he says finally. Hey. Hagakure lights up, reaching over Sarah to frantically tap on Bakugo's shoulders. Isn't this so exciting? It wasn't too long ago that we were at one of their very first concerts in the city, and now Riot's gotten so big and famous. Obviously. Bakugo wants to say. He'd been the one to tip Agakure off about Riot's first concert, because he couldn't actually believe it when he'd seen the info. Kirishima Ejiro, in a band, playing as the opening act for Present Mike. Going by himself would have attracted too much attention, but Agakure's always been good at deflecting press. Yeah, he mutters, sinking back into his seat. It's really fucking great. Higakuri rolls her eyes, turns back to chat with Uraka. 
The box slowly fills up with others. Midoriya and Ida, Tagata Mirio, Shinso Itoshi. Bakugo wonders how many of these losers Kirishima invited in person. Has he been talking to all of them for the weeks he's kept radio silent with Bakugo? And if so, how is that fair? You've ruined it, he tells himself. You should have reacted differently. Better. When Kirishima was so upset. But he was upset himself, and how could he be expected to think straight then? It's easy for everyone, himself included, to assume he's the one in the wrong. But he'd extended the goddamn olive branch. When is Kirishima going to reach forward and take it already? I can hear you grinding your teeth, Sarah says to him. He still hasn't gotten the whole story out of Sarah, about why he and Ashido have decided to try again, or what's passed between them. Sarah is being surprisingly close-lipped about the entire situation, and it's annoying as fuck. Hasn't he had to deal with all their drama for months? Doesn't he deserve to know if they're going to crash and burn again? But Sarah has been happier these past few days, and definitely more at ease. Of course, with Bakugo nominated for a Shimura Nana award, Sarah's own stock is rising. Whether Bakugo wins or not, Sarah is going to have his hands full for the next 18 months at least. But his recent happiness isn't the kind of frantic, productive energy he usually has when he's busy being Bakugo's agent. It's something calmer, more innate. Oh, fuck me, Bakugo groans, rubbing a hand on his face. You're in love. The tips of Sarah's ears turn pink, and he turns to clamp a hand over Bakugo's mouth. Shh, we're not telling anyone we're back together yet. Bakugo shoves him away, barks out a harsh laugh. And maybe don't show up at my place the morning after you've been someone's goddamn booty call, then. The blush troubles across Sarah's face, over his nose and cheeks. It wasn't like that. We were just talking and one thing led to another. Shut up, you're so embarrassing. Bakugo elbows Sarah in the stomach. Quiet, everyone! Ida orders from the row of seats behind them. It's starting! Bakugo lifts a hand to flip Ida the bird, but as the stadium lights dim and the crowd roars in anticipation, he forgets his irritation and watches the stage instead. Present mic opens, which is somehow fitting. He doesn't play a full set, but goes through a number of his hits before covering one of Riot's own songs. Before he leaves the stage, he talks about how these kids have inspired him, and how happy he is that they still respect the old god enough to invite him to participate in this concert. Fat Gum is next. Bakugo doesn't think he's ever actually heard his music, until he starts rapping. Then he realizes that everyone has heard Fat Gum's music, whether they know it or not. The large man wears furious orange, his movements on stage slow and calming, even as his words go a million miles a second. He ends his set wishing the audience peace and hope in who they are. Nejiri Chan is on next. Bakugo mostly knows her from her acting work, but as an idol she's adept at most things. She wears a midnight blue gown that shines like there are stars embedded in it, delicate gossamer wings extending from her back. Everyone in the stadium is screaming her name, singing along to every lyric of her songs. After her comes Sun Eater, with Amajiki Tamaki leading the way. Bakugo feels the familiar stirrings of jealousy as he looks out at Amajiki, sees how effortlessly he plays the guitar the emotion he conveys with his voice. He and Kirishima are bonded through music, in a way that Bakugo can never get close to. But that doesn't mean he's out of luck, does it? Before Sanita leaves the stage, Nejiri-chan returns to it. She waltzes up to the microphone, and she and Amajiki begin to sing one of Riot's songs, 
the first one Ashido and Kirishima had sung on stage together. Their voices harmonized differently than Ashido and Kirishima's, giving an entirely different tone to the song. But it works, and the crowd erupts with applause and cheers when they're done. At the close of the set, the stage goes dark once more. It stays that way for an agonizing minute, until everyone knows who must be coming next. Bakugo's heart beats fast, faster, until he's sure it's about to get lodged in his throat. Next to him, Sarah grabs his shoulder, giving it a comforting squeeze. Breathe, man, he says. I think you're going to enjoy this. A single spotlight shines down on the stage, revealing a sleek black piano and Ashido sitting at it. She's dressed in perfectly tailored black cigarette pants and a metallic magenta blazer. As the crowd begins to clap, she lifts a hand and waves. Then she brings one finger to her lips and the crowd immediately goes silent. Ashido smiles to herself, her fingers dancing over the piano keys. She starts to play and within a few notes, Bakugo recognizes the song. It's the same one he'd caught her singing at Todoroki's birthday party, sad and mournful. She plays through the first verse, her voice rich and deep and filled with sorrow. The entire crowd holds its breath. Beside him, Sarah clutches his hands together. Bakugo wonders if he knows that Ashido is singing for him to him. As the first verse ends, a second spotlight turns on. Just to one side, Jiro stands with an electric violin perched between her chin and shoulder. Her outfit is like Ashido's, her blazer a deep purple. As Ashido begins to sing again, Jiro lays her bow across the violin strings and adds a new dimension to the song. Then. For the third verse, a third spotlight. Kaminari stands up, drumsticks crossed together over his head. His yellow blazer catches the light as he sits down, finally bringing the drum beat into the song. It's hard to breathe, because there's only one person left. There's no fourth verse, just a bridge back into the chorus. And as it starts, the fourth spotlight hits the stage. Kirishima's blazer is, of course, a deep red. From his shiny black shoes to his perfectly spiked hair, he's a man full of confidence and purpose. He ducks his head and shuts his eyes as he plays the melody of the song, the guitar finally lifting the music to the joyful feeling it usually has. Kirishima doesn't join in on the singing, but Ashido's voice changed through every verse. Instead of mourning, she's celebrating now. As the song comes to a close, music ending abruptly, the spotlights shut off all at once. Then, a low light rises from the stage, illuminating the four members of Riot. Hey, Kirishima says into the microphone. We're Riot. Thank you for being here. And we hope you enjoy the show. The show goes by in a blur. The four members of Riot rotate on the mic, each introducing songs and poking fun at each other. Ashido and Kirishima are both singing, and the audience is loving every minute of it. They go through songs from their first album, every radio hit and all the lesser knowns. Bakugo wonders if he's imagining it the way Kirishima's eyes keep drifting towards the VIP box. There's no way you can see him up here, right? But maybe he just expects that Bakugo will be there, and that's good enough. Maybe he believes in that as surely as he believed that Bakugo would get his nomination. This is how Kirishima should always look, doing what he loves with confidence, smiling through it all. Bakugo wants to bottle up how he feels right now, or solidify it so he can hit Kirishima over the head with it every time he starts doubting himself. They've gone through most of the material they have. 
Bakugo knows because he knows all of Kirishima's songs. There's a new album they've been working on, but are they ready to let all those songs out into the world yet? Kirishima was even keeping them secret from Bakugo. Kirishima has one hand resting on the mic stand, guitar slung across his back. Hey everyone, I wanted to thank you all for being here, from the bottom of my heart. There's nothing manlier than standing up for a cause you believe in. So I just want to say, all of you guys are my heroes, right now. The crowd cheers, whistles, calls out its admiration. They love Kirishima, that much is abundantly clear. Bakugo is caught between jealousy and the thought that it's about fucking time that the world appreciated Kirishima and realized what Bakugo has known for years. Kirishima laughs bashfully, runs a hand through his hair. Maybe he's not as confident as he's been projecting all night. This is a special night for us for a lot of reasons. And to send it off right, we want to share a new song with you guys. I think we might need a little bit of help though. What do you think, Ashido? Leaning against her own mic, Ashido shrugs elaborately. Maybe just a little. Okay then. Kirishima slings his guitar back around as Kaminari begins to drum. Let's go. Bakugo's never heard this song before. He shuts his eyes for a moment, letting it wash over him. But then Kirishima starts to sing and he has to open his eyes again because he just has to know how Kirishima looks in that moment. Ashido's back at the piano, light notes flowing throughout the song. Jiro and Kirishima play the song on their guitars, facing each other and laughing as they go. Kaminari keeps up the steady beat, and Bakuro swears it's the same tempo his heart is pumping blood to. The first chorus fades out, and then someone else starts singing. Bakugo can't place the voice until a spotlight hits the stage and a tall older man in a rough leather jacket steps up to Kirishima, mic in hand. He throws an arm around Kirishima's shoulders and then the two of them are singing together. Crimson Chevalier and Riot, their music coming together in one song. Holy shit. Holy fucking shit. Bakugo thought they'd just talk or something, but Kirishima, that stupid genius, he'd gotten Crimson Chevalier to sing on one of his songs. He's on stage in front of tens of thousands of people, and he's singing with his idol. And the entire world is looking at him and loving him and everything he represents. I love him so fucking much, Bakugo thinks, chest tight. He loves him so much, he wants to reach out and grab him now, and tell him so. The song rises to a triumphant crescendo. Kirishima is singing with such passion, it's like he's screaming into the mic. Crimson Chevalier and Ashi are right along with him. And then it's done. Kirishima reaches up, as if to brush tears from his eyes. This time, when he looks towards the VIP box, Bakugo knows he isn't imagining Kirishima's gaze on him. And then he says, slowly and calmly, That was for you, and for me, and for everyone who's ever felt this way. <laughs>